Welcome to the Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another exciting show. This time, a regular show called Media Watch. I'm your host, Dot Savvy, and my co-host here happens to be. I'm Shamshir Singh from the Sikh Research Institute. And together, we'll be presenting to you a roundup of the news on a regular basis. And we're trying to get this to be a weekly show. Uh, we'd love your feedback. You can always send us an email at the normal Sikh channel address. So the way that we're structuring this program is that we've got the show into four formats. We'll talk a little bit about the main headline, which is just one main topic of the news. Uh, and then we'll talk about news in general across the world. So we're trying to connect with the global media to bring you a lot more information about what's actually happening, whether it be local or whether it be international. Now, specifically, we want to talk about seat news as well. So that's the third element of the show. And we're also going to have this week in history. So in one way, we get to find out what happened all those years ago that are really, really important. So let's kick off the first part of the show. Well, I guess the topic that's on everyone's lips right now is the win of Narendra Modi over in India. And uh, he has done a landslide. And a lot of people have voted for him. Obviously, that means it's a landslide. Or have they? Because interestingly, we were having a discussion about how many people actually vote. Because sometimes, even I think in American elections or whether it be the UK elections, the first past the post doesn't necessarily mean that the biggest majority of people have actually voted. Interestingly, I think the Indian population is something like 1.2 billion, and it's something like 800 and something million that voted, is that right? Um, the electorate is 810 million, and the number of people that voted is 165 million okay. in total. And out of those, um, I think the exact statistic here... Where did you get those statistics from? By um, from the Electoral Commission. Right, okay. um, sorry, 541 million people in total voted in this year's election right. and 165.4 million voted for the BJP. So that's uh, out of the people that voted, out of the 541 million that voted, 33%, just over 33% voted for Modi. Okay, so, um, so much you for saying, a democracy, I suppose, yeah, isn't it? And you were saying that, that works out to be a representative of 16%. Something like that. My calculations kind of go down that route, yeah. um, which, uh, again, it's obviously a way in which the electoral system actually works. Um, there's a lot of talk about it being the biggest um, democracy in the world. I guess if you watch the opening sequences of Slumdog Millionaire, uh, you'll know that the, um, the police and some of the human rights are literally in the dark ages. Uh, but there are examples where, you know, there are loads of really great graduates coming out from India. Uh, they're making great progress in terms of all the, I guess, companies in the U.S. and the U.K. and certain other sectors that are keen on investing. It's a developing economy. I always look at India in one context and say, what a great place it is, uh, but what a, a missed opportunity to have uh, equal rights, uh, which is something that I'm, I'm quite after, really. Uh, I was actually reading earlier on, and uh, again, part of the program that we have here is to really bring you news from uh, different parts, different media outlets. Uh, and I was reading today on the BBC News website, was uh, putting forward the fact that the Pakistani leader, uh, Nawaz Sharif, uh, has um, been invited to the uh, inauguration, uh, and they're not really sure whether he's actually going to turn up or not, but apparently it's the first time that a Pakistani leader has been invited uh, just going back to the statistics again, it's the, apparently the biggest victory of any party in India since uh, 30 years. Um, and 30 years does kind of resonate with us for other reasons that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, now, interestingly, one more thing I wanted to say was, do you know about some of the challenges facing that government? You know, we're not here to criti be critical. We're here to look at, you know, what the news is, is saying and kind of uh, put an eye on uh, a news review, really. That's what the whole point of it actually is. Uh, tell us, um, what do you think? Do you think there's a lot of challenges? Apparently there's really bad weather systems over in India, all around yeah. the world. That's going to affect farmers, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's huge challenges facing India at the moment. I, I recently went to Punjab after 14 years. It's the first time I went there. Um, and there's just the gap between rich and poor is, is absolutely incredible. It, it boggles the mind. I mean, on one hand, as you're saying, there's so much economic development and there's so much investment going on and there's big business there. But on the other hand, there's a huge amount of illiteracy still. There's a huge amount of poverty still in the country and infrastructure problems, essentially, um, and systems of governance. I mean, there's, there's still cars on the road that r ride around on the wrong side and you know, no lights are on, on the back of vehicles at night. So, I mean, really, lifestyle problems is, a, is going to be a big challenge for uh, any government in India. But I think particularly for a nationalist government, um, usually 
with their rhetoric, they kind of undermine all of the problems, and it, everything becomes about you know the, the ideas of nationalism and and right wing. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I do find it hard parties. to kind of come to terms with the fact that you've got you know they're positioned as being Hindu nationalist, right? Yeah. Whereas rather they should be more nationalist. Yeah. It just happens that the ticket that they've ridden on seems to have that kind of backdrop. Yeah. Obviously. Um, they have links with other organizations which are, are questionable. But if we focus in on the ticket that they probably came to government with, which is about economic improvement, um, improving the GDP, uh, there is another challenge. They have something like $100 billion outstanding in bad debt loans. Um, also, there's uh, another area that you need to be aware of, which is uh, Article 370, which talks about the constitution in Kashmir and how that's going to be handled. Uh, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but is that the uh, Ayodhya Mosque, uh, which was um, uh, taken down and there's a thought about putting a, a Hindu um, manda there, that's been sealed off. So whether or not they uh, are going to kind of sanction building something there. Um, you know, a party at the end of the day, if it's nationalist, needs to kind of look up the, all the citizens in that country. So we hope that that's actually going to happen. So... We will see, and the, um, I guess the jury's out in terms of uh, how they're going to get on uh, in government. Uh, talking to people, obviously they looked at the AAP organization, the Army Party, and uh, they looked at that as being uh, one particular route um, to look at non-corruption. Uh, they also had Congress being led by uh, a Gandhi descendant. Uh, well, you know, I, I guess it's, you know, which... which particular organization do you choose that's going to take them forward? I think I'm a bit worried about the whole thing, really. I think it's quite worrying as well, I mean, especially with the Ahmadmi party. I was reading today um, how Kijriwale is going to be sentenced to go to prison. Really? Um, yeah, for um, labeling one of the rival party members as corrupt. Um, so there's a defamation kind case. Kind of a litigation on. type. Thing. Yeah. Okay, well, we, d we don't know the detail. We're not here to discuss uh, individuals. But at the, at the end of the day, uh, there is clearly um, a problem. Uh, in terms of uh, development and infrastructure. And let's just go back to the same uh, thing that we were talking about earlier on, the kind of this whole infrastructure. Uh, I often wonder when you look at the skyscrapers that are built, and beautiful skyscrapers they are, uh, but the foundations are often built by uh, women and construction workers who are holding Children. rocks in their heads uh, in these kind of round, yeah. um, they're working all day in the sun and their kids are on the side, yeah. you know, running around all in a hut. So that kind of, uh, you know, polarization of economics or um, actual, um, I guess, uh, economic wealth isn't necessarily equally distributed. So it's very easy for us to sit in the UK and criticize another country. Um, it's very difficult for that country to recover from uh, such difficult economics. But where there's a world, there's a way, really. I think I, I strongly believe in that. And uh, if we did have a, a, a greater attitude to help people, then... Uh, Maybe we can do that. Interestingly, the, uh, the particular party, Modi's party, was um, supported by quite a lot of people outside of India. A lot of money came into that campaign, um, and a lot of money was spent yeah. uh, on his victory as well. So um, got to get your priorities right. So let's move on to the second part of the show, which really talks about the world news. Um, at the moment, we've got some headlines that are hitting most of the newspapers. Uh, a lot of people be aware of the terrible situation in Nigeria uh, with the kidnapped girls. Uh, I am astounded by the fact that it took something like four to five weeks for that news to actually come to uh, the rest of the world. Uh, and it was great that Obama actually stood up and said, we need to do something about it. Uh, but I don't see a lot of progress. And I see a lot of um, these kind of news items just to, to disappear into the, into the background. Interestingly, Nigeria is Africa's most populous nation. Uh, it's the biggest economy uh, and has the largest amount of oil in terms of production, but many of its people are living in poverty. So again, a similar situation where you know, a lot of resources and, and difficult to manage that. Other news items we find that uh, recently, and this is actually from the BBC website, uh, they were talking about Saudi Arabia and the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome uh, a problem. That's the, uh, known as Middle East Respiratory uh, Syndrome. Uh, MERS, it's a virus, uh, and it has affected quite a lot of people in uh, those particular regions. Uh, over 200 people have died uh, since the flu-like virus actually emerged, uh, and that's uh, over two years ago when it first emerged. So I think the new health minister over there 
has committed to uh, giving it a priority to help find out what happened. I think there's a case that started up in the US as well. So watch this space, uh, but don't be alarmed about it. We also find in the news that the Thai army has pu uh, been uh, imposing a martial law. It's called uh, to preserve the law and order. Uh, it's called that. And it's granting the army sweeping powers to enforce its decision. Uh, both pro and anti-government protesters have been told not to match, uh, march out anywhere uh, to prevent clashes taking place. And I was reading a little bit of background behind this. Again, this is a common theme emerging, uh, corruption, uh, accusations yeah. of corruption and people standing up, which actually goes uh, as far as one of the things I was talking about. I, I had an opportunity to be on uh, um, BBC Radio recently, which is quite nice to give me a shout. Um, what do you think, in your view, about the power of the people? Do you think that people have enough power to drive change, you know, whether it be you know, not buying clothes from a particular retail outlet who've got bad practices in particular countries? Do you think we've got an opportunity or do you think people don't bother? Definitely. I mean, if you take the, the Thai example, yeah. the fact that the people do have uh, um, the power, otherwise the military wouldn't be imposing restrictions on their movement. Right. Um, and it's always the first case um, when people do gather, the first thing that the state usually does is impose restrictions on their movement and their communication and, and their free speech, essentially because they're afraid of people networking and, and gathering steam and taking direct action when the traditional channels have failed. But saying that, Let's just talk about this a little bit frankly in terms of the Sikh situation. 1984, news blackout, right? So no one gets a chance to know what's going on in the country um, and you'll get whatever the propaganda machine has at, actually generated at that point. Um, does it mean that 1984 uh, was a different time and could it happen again? Could, could a country like India or some other country that wants to do something to its population just do a news blackout and we wouldn't know any of the, any of the better? I, I think that again perfectly demonstrates what I'm trying to say is that the people have so much power and the first thing the state will do is try to restrict their communication. Turn off so, the uh, internet. Exactly. To stop people from sending stuff to exactly. their mobile phones. Because yeah. so, they know when people start congregating and getting together and start taking matters into their own hands, look, essentially the state has a limited number of resources, whether it's police officers or soldiers, um, and it's always going to be um, a small percentage compared to the general population. Let, let's talk about the fact that we're making this assumption that people power is around the fact that we've all got mobile phones uh, and we've got the power to connect to 3G if the transmitter happens to be on. But not everyone's got access to technology, have they? So do you not think that we have a moral responsibility to fight, defend the defenseless? Yeah, definitely we do. I mean, now we have our modern communication devices and smartphones. I'm, I'm talking about the person that hasn't got a lot of money. Um, I'm talking about the person who's a that, farmer used to... who is, you know... Poverty striking, yeah. you know. Before that, people, I mean, people still read newspapers today and people do have um, access and you always find people communicating. Word of mouth is still, I mean, advertisers say it's still the most powerful means of marketing and not, communication. Not if, the, not if the channels, I'm trying to be a devil's advocate, not if the channels are switched off and, you know, there's no way you can get out. People no will always find a way. I mean, that's essentially what the state tried to ensure took place um, in Amritsar in 1984. They tried to ensure that it was a black hole type operation. Right. Um, and that's according to the military generals there. Um, and it always works in their favor to have, mm. you know, darkness and to have no communication. But people, I just, you, know, you can't stop <laughs> the communicative force of human beings. It's, I mean, we're social animals. It's something that we will always be there and, and we'll and always the, find the, a way. The terrible thing is that 30 years later, we don't have any justice for anyone um, who may have suffered during that period. Uh, yeah. and continue to suffer as well, whether it be the widow colony. More news that we have here is, for example, the UK retail sales growth is at its 10-year high. Uh, interesting, they say it's down to food sales, uh, biggest since 2002. Uh, also, they were saying something down to sales promotions. That's the one that I'm quite interested in. Buy one, get one free, or buy two and get the third one at a particular price. Uh, I'm not sure whether I agree with that necessarily in terms of the amount of wastage that happens. You might be ending up spending more money, but food-wise, there's waste, isn't there? You know, yeah. If you buy two salads and then um, you know, they're kept in the fridge, it's going to go off, isn't it? Yeah. You know, if, you're not, if you're not consuming it in time. So in a way, that's waste, isn't it? Well, it depends how hungry that your family is, really. <laughs> no, no. Well, I would say <laughs> it's down to people wanting value for money, but yeah. actually being kind of forced to go down a particular route are spending more money in order to line the pockets of the retail organizations, but then that food going to waste because they think they're getting a bargain by buying more than they actually need. Now, that's not down to greed. Yeah. That's just down to that's sales promotions. That's interesting because 
when you do see these buy one get one freeze uh, these offers on it's usually they're charging you for both products anyway it's just right. it's just a you marketing a spin anyway. yeah, yeah it's the advertising spin and you're right it does uh, it does draw people in it kind of traps them essentially mm. yeah okay i had another news item here that came in uh, we find out the mortgage lending has leaked uh, and we're talking the uk specifically rather than in other countries uh, lending was up 36 percent more than about a year ago I think the average price in London has gone up to something like 16% in terms of house prices. And I know the governor of, uh, uh, of England is suggesting that possibly a rise in uh, interest rates to control this. But what I'd like to look at, you're a young chap, you know, it's going to be difficult to uh, save up enough money, get the deposit down to buy a house. Even with um, the kind of um, assistance to buy uh, government campaign that uh, is out there to help yeah. people with a certain percentage, uh, it is going to be increasingly hard uh, I know a lot of people spend a lot of money on marriages. Yeah. Uh, and then um, some of that money could go into um, supporting that particular uh, couple if they mm. want to uh, not live uh, with their in-laws or wherever they live. Uh, so it's an interesting one, isn't it, where it's very difficult to, uh, to see how that is going to develop in the future, whether the bubble will burst. Uh, and suddenly we'll find that people with um, housing portfolios are suffering because they're not able to afford... The, um, the interest rate with, when it comes in, in terms of uh, whether it goes up, as a way of curtailing the amount of um, house, um, I guess, uh, buying uh, that may or may not happen. So let's uh, move on to the next part. I'm going to hand over to Shimshir Singh for a while with the third part of this program, the third segment, as we call it. Um, tell us a little bit about some Sikh news, news in the, the current, uh, I guess, world, UK, uh, in terms of CK, Sikhs. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a, a few interesting developments. If we go a bit broader at the moment, um, there's been a global report by United Six that's been launched today um, looking at all aspects of uh, the Sikh population throughout the world. And one of the most interesting findings from there shows that the, there's an increasing number of hate attacks against Sikhs. Okay. Um, Do they know where that is? Is that like U US based rather uh, than UK based? America and Europe, yeah. Okay. Right, yeah, still the kind of leftover of uh, mistaken identity. In that yeah, kind of thing, I think right? so, essentially, yeah. Um, so you've got statistics on that or anything? Or? No, there's, uh, it's just been, this news has just come out an hour ago. Right. Um, so the full statistics haven't been published yet. Um, and also, um, a Sikh uh, Human Development Foundation in America, on a brighter note, has donated $330,000 um, for needy students in Punjab. So that's oh, a okay, fantastic really bit yeah, of really news. Really lovely there. way of uh, investing back in a, a particular country. Definitely, yeah. and I think uh, a lot more of that is needed, um, right. especially in Punjab with the education. Um, um, there's also been an attack um, at Gurdwara. Um, this has just come in now about an hour ago. Um, we'll see how that story develops over the coming weeks. Was that in the UK? Is that um, no, this is actually in India. So yeah. there's been a bit of a situation happening um, at Shalimabag Gurdwara. Um, so we're seeing uh, a lot of... Um, that's going to obviously develop into a huge story as the, as the time develops. Do we know the reason for that or anything? Or, it's, know, there, never, there never is a reason to do that kind of it's stuff. It's just some of, vandals, apparently. Culprits haven't been caught. They broke into a Gurdwara. Um, they uh, desecrated the Guru Granth Sahib. They threw um, the Guru Granth Sahib into a dump somewhere. Sorry, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's absolutely terrible. So we'll see how that story develops um, over the coming week. Um, this week um, is also the first anniversary of uh, the death of uh, Lee Rigby. Um, and the Khalsa bikers are going to be going down um, and joining with uh, a lot of other motorcyclists in a, a slow ride of commemoration uh, and respect for uh, Lee Rigby. So that, that's very interesting. There's going to be a lot of media coverage um, taking place on that. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Um, and there's two books being launched this mm -hmm. week. Um, there's a, a book by yourself. <laughs> by me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. You that's mentioned been, it. Right. Yeah. That's um, being launched. Yeah. Uh, 30 years uh, uh, for hope and justice. Um, you can get it in the Kindle store. So, um, yeah, I wrote that, uh, took a few months looking at history of Sikhs in 1900, I've written some poems, uh, written some thoughts about what happened, uh, and trying to put forward a picture of what we can do in the future. So that, that was my book. Uh, uh, 30 Years of Hope and, uh, uh, and Justice. What a plug. What a plug, you know. <laughs> there's, a, there's also another book um, similarly themed on um, 1984. It's called Reflections on 1984. Um, and there's a book launch happening in uh, central London. Um, you can see the details online. I'm sure they'll be on six channels, Facebook and social media pages. Right. So that's a uh, very interesting um, events happening. Brilliant. So thank you for that. And uh, as we develop the show on a week-on-week -week basis, uh, as I said, we hope, 
uh, we'll bring you more news uh, from around the world. And uh, we'll give you uh, an email address, something like info at seekchannel.tv, if you want to send us any uh, updates that you may have in your local area. So we've been through, just as a quick catch up, we've been through the major headline, uh, which is about the fact that uh, Modi's won the uh, elections in India. We've gone through a set of uh, headlines uh, from around the world, which are more generic, and we've just been talking about Sikh news. So let's continue with what is a historic event that you can tell us about that happened uh, this week? So on the 23rd of March, it's the birth of uh, Guru Amr Das Ji. Um, so that's very interesting for us because he was a very interesting guru, just like the rest of them. Um, he established the city of Goindwal. Um, he's a very keen advocate of social justice. So he did away with uh, the uh, Sati and Parda. Um, and he also um, introduced Pangat. So everyone had to sit together equally. So he f as further um, solidified the institution of Langar. Um, and he also was a great administrator. Uh, he introduced the Manji system. Um, where the Sikh congregations would have to uh, be more um, managed and their funds and the assets of the community could be more effectively managed. And um, he was a, a trendsetter and a leader because he introduced women um, into, into those roles as well as administrators of his manjis, um, which is something that he, you never saw before in South Asia. So he was a, a revolutionary just like the gurus before him and the gurus after him. So um, that's a, a bit of reflection for this week on... Guru Amar Das Ji, and you can read more about Guru Amar Das Ji online. Um, he's a very interesting person. Absolutely. So, yeah, thanks for that. So, again, as we develop the show on and on, uh, we will bring you more history uh, about Sikhs and what a great heritage the Sikhs actually have. So that's it, really, for this week. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this show. It's a short show that talks about the news, uh, the media, the media that we're watching, the media that you're watching. Um, watch out for... Uh, a set of stories, as uh, Shamsher just said, that he's been um, talking about. Watch out for the fact that, obviously, there's a terrible situation in Nigeria. There's a terrible situation in Thailand. Uh, we hope that economically, in the UK, uh, the trends that you see there are not necessarily reflective uh, in terms of future strategies to make it difficult for people to pay their mortgages. Um, and just going back to where we started off the show with regards to the Modi election uh, win, yeah, it's a decisive win. I'm not sure there's a lot of choice out there, but that's no excuse for necessarily bringing in uh, an organization which um, has a, a lot of questions uh, and a lot of challenges to face with in the future. So until next time, we look forward to hearing from you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Why could you go Khalsa? Why could you give a day?